ora. Welcome to Child Poverty in Aotearoa, Tackling Inequality 2014. This week, we're focusing on early childhood care and education. Are children from poor families getting access to early childhood care and education? How disadvantaged are they if they don't receive these services? Is the early childhood care and education they receive of high quality? Do the hidden costs of attendance prevent children from poor families from accessing services? And what role does culture have to play in providing appropriate early childhood care and education to children from Māori and Pacifica families? To talk more about these issues, I'm joined by Carol Smith and Lucy Koro. Talo for Lucy, welcome to the programme. Talo for Katrina. And tēnā koe Carol. Tēnā koe Katrina. Can you tell us about some of your experience in the early childhood sector? I've been in early childhood about 30 years in a, a wide variety of roles that I've played, not only in New Zealand but overseas as well. And mm -hmm. I've been uh, someone who started off, didn't intend to be in early childhood, but went to a centre and took my two children, my friend's centre, and really haven't left. So I've been uh, a manager. Um, I've um, worked in Vanuatu in the early childhood field and in London and I'm currently a pauako or lecturer at Te Whare Wānanga or Wairaka which is Unitech on the Bachelor of Teaching Early Childhood Education. And why is early childhood care and education important for children? The right kind of early childhood education uh, is important for children because children need to socialise. They need to learn skills um, before they get to school. However, I have to say that the skills that I would like children to learn before they get to school are skills that are for life, not for school. They are skills that we need to work with them on so that they have a curiosity for learning, they have an ability to be emotionally competent, socially competent, and those kind of skills that if they don't have them before they get to school, that's when they, it's, it's difficult for them. Yeah. How are our poor children missing out on learning some of those skills at an early stage? I believe that um, with all government policies, which usually come out as a one-shoe-fits-all, actually do not meet the needs of our poorer children, our poorer families. And I do have to question what poor means, because there are many families who f poor is that they don't have enough money for food or medicines or medical treatment. But they're also poor because they don't trust the system and so there's a, a not meeting their, their wairua or their spiritual needs as well. So um, it's important that these children attend early childhood centres that meet the family and the children's needs before they go to school because the state system doesn't or very rarely caters for the, the individual. It's about m me having to fit into a group. Mm. Mm -hmm. And Lucy, tell us about your centre. Um, our centre is uh, Samoan Bilingual. We do um, implement Ma Te Reo and a bit of English, but mainly in the Samoan language. So, so um, yeah, we encourage the teacher to speak in our Samoan language. And how many children at your centre? Uh, we have about 30 children. 10 under 2s and all over 20 over 2s. Mm. How important is it learning Samoan at the centre? I think it's, it's very important at that age because children need to learn their values, their culture and um, you know there's a say that you can never hide who you are especially like every children comes with a surname Samoan and if you grow up knowing nothing about your background or your mother tongue language or it, then I don't think it's really gonna work well you being an islander when you don't know anything about it. 
And Carol, what have you got to say about how important it is for cultural aspects for Māori and Pacifica children in early childhood centres? Oh, it's absolutely essential. If I don't know who I am, then I become part of the flock and um, I don't have a sense of belonging. We have a curriculum uh, called Te Whāreke and one of the most important strands is mana whenua, that I know where I belong and I know who I am. And with, with, with Lucy's centre, um, Fa'a Masani, yeah. Aunga Mata, Aunga Mata mm. um, they try so hard to ensure that the children who come to, school, to their early childhood centre are very strong in their Samoan so that when they leave they can either go into a bilingual unit um, or they've got a sense of, of well-being. Mm. And the same with Māori children. Māori children need to know that they, need to, they belong in Aotearoa. They need to be able to stand up and say, I am Māori and I'm proud. And um, if they can't do that in this country, then they can't do it anywhere. Yeah. Is there a widespread problem of children from poorer families not getting access to early childhood care and education? Yes, there is, because there are many, many things that um, uh, inhibit Fano from uh, accessing early childhood education. From my experience and my cultural perspective, many of those things are about my way of knowing, being and doing, my way of being Māori. And a, an example for myself is for my mukopuna, my grandchildren. We had to drive a long way to have our children in early childhood education and in kura because that's what that those are the values that we have. So for many Māori Fano, they don't have the money to have a car. They don't have the money um, to be able to travel far um, and it, it becomes it becomes problematic about how how they resource the funds to be able to um, place their children in early childhood care and education which meets their needs. Mm. What do you think are the key qualities for good early childhood care and education? Obviously you're saying that culture is very important. Mm. That as a that I'm that the child comes with a fano and if I, as an early childhood teacher, do not incorporate that Fano and see that child as a, a part of a Fano and look behind that child as to who supports that that child, then I don't think I can meet the needs of the of the child because I don't know really know what the child is about and where that what that child's way of knowing, being, and doing is unless I connect with the Fano. Mm. Is that your view as well, Lucy? I think it's, it's um, the quality of education at that age is very important because um, the, the Samoan mentality and I'm sure a lot of Pacific Island mentality is um, at that age you don't need, there's no education needed, you just need to be babysit and but um, yeah so I think now with having a early childhood year and having the experience to know that it is very important to have an education for all children at an early age and the quality of caring, you know, because the health and safety of the children that you've been trusted to look after and mm -hmm. so it's those kind of issues that's really important in early childhood. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What qualifications should be required for teachers providing early childhood care and education? I think the minimum uh, is a degree, three year training through a registered and a, a, a provider. For me the most important thing um, from a Māori perspective is that the training provider provides a bicultural program so that uh, teachers when they leave the training, they're very aware of Te Tiriti o Waitangi, they're very aware of their responsibilities as teachers and citizens to, um, to understand Te Tiriti o Waitangi and to incorporate that in their pedagogy and their philosophy. Otherwise Māori children are going to continue to be um, brown-skinned 
white children and um, from a Māori grandmother and a, a Māori mother that needs to be addressed all the time. Obviously that's really important for you that you're providing Samoan language and culture in your centre. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah it is very important mm -hmm. that we do. And um, and the other thing I want to touch point to, when, uh, the qualifications. I think as um, the other very important qualifications that I, know, I can see working as being a mother, because mm -hmm. yeah, we um, sometimes having degrees is not providing the quality of caring and and you know the curriculum is it is important that you do qualify but the full caring and the health and safety of the children mm -hmm. is all like experience of being a, a mother or grandmother practical yeah, knowledge yeah, practical knowledge <laughs> thank you lucy thank you very thank much you carol Now it's time for the Child Poverty Win of the Week. Seven lower decile North Island schools are achieving unusually good results for their pupils after putting in sustained efforts to lift achievement. New Zealand has one of the largest gaps in achievement between poorer and well-off students in the developed world. Macaulay High School in Otahu in Auckland has focused on community engagement and making the college a safe place to be. Gisborne Boys High School uses a two tane program, while Otaki College acts rapidly when issues arise and often involves the community in solutions. Oportiki College has set up a morning tea group of at-risk students and provides staff mentoring for them. Now let's talk to Linda Petrenko and Meg Moss about the difficulties parents face in obtaining subsidies for childcare fees from work and income. We'll also hear about the role played by early childhood centres in picking up special learning needs, physical developmental delays and hearing problems. And what impact does the inflexibility of Ministry of Education funding for centres have? Kia ora Meg, welcome to the programme. Kia ora Katrina, nice to meet you. And kia ora Linda, welcome. Hi Katrina, nice to meet you. You're the manager of small Kauri Child Care Centre in Mangari. How many children attend the centre? Um, we have a daily roll of 37. Seven of them are under two and the rest are between two and five years old. Of, over a week we have um, 43 children currently. So some part-time, some full-time, yes. Yeah. Can you tell us about the work and income process for obtaining a subsidy towards childcare fees? Um, well, you know, it's a bit of a catch-22 for parents when they're trying to do this. Um, they're looking for work, so um, and often work and income has required so that they actually look for work with young children. So they're looking for a job, then they get through an interview process really, and they suddenly have a job, and then they have to find childcare. Um, and then in coming and finding a place of childcare they have to do some forms and then go back to work and income. So you can't find a childcare and get the work and income started while you're looking for work. So everything happens at the last minute basically. Um, work and income doesn't ever pay um, the childcare subsidy in advance, it's always a week in arrears. And if you were applying say in March this year you, well we have been told numerous times that they're running at least four weeks behind in processing the information. So there's often at least four weeks, sometimes more, before a childcare subsidy will come through for a parent. And you know we're stuck in a catch-22 because we think, well, um, do we say to this person, no, you have to pay until work and income kicks in? How can they do that? They're just coming off a benefit and trying to start, start work. Um, so they're learning a whole lot of new, skill, new skills um, in there. Um, or do we say, okay, let's support you, we'll take you on, which is what we actually do. Um, and then, as I've had this morning, um, in the weekend I received a letter to decline a child's um, childcare support. Um, they've been attending since the middle of March. And is your experience similar? Yeah, yes it is and it's very difficult for, for parents to find 
a, a child care placement, particularly if they've got a couple of children under five. Um, and it just adds to the worry of, and stress of them trying, trying to get work. There trying to juggle finances. Yes, yes. Yeah. There should be a, a, a slightly more humane system. Mm. What additional challenges does taking children to childcare add for parents on benefits? Oh, um, you know, it, it's a phenomenal stress, I think, to start. Um, they're starting by having to go, go back to work, having had a time away from work, so their confidence is low. They have had uh, a totally different set of um, time schedules put in place, so they're having to get up earlier and be more organised, and they're going to have to rush their children to get them into the centre by a particular time, and they have to be there for a, by a particular time, because the Ministry of Education requires them to, f to sign in and out at times for their funding. So that's an essential thing, apart from starting work. They're going to require things that they may not have had. They might need lunch boxes and drink bottles. They might need a raincoat that they really haven't had because come what may, they've still got to get out there. Um, they've got to manage their finances, so they're going to have to find the funding and be able to regularly pay whatever is left as a residue because work and income may not cover the entire amount. So there still might be fees to be paid. Um, then they've got to deal with the child getting sick because they will, they're exposed to a whole pile of new germs that they haven't been out to and then they'll have the stress of then having to take up time off work to tend to the child. They may not be able to get to their GP because they're at work all day and their GP might finish at five o'clock. So they'll see the urgent GP who's on and then will the child even have a decent um, you know, if I go to my GP I've got a file and the, the doctor knows me but Many children are not really even known, so the circumstances sort of, um, for, and the background for what's going for a child long term is not known. They won't go to Plunkett, because Plunkett won't run a clinic probably in weekends. So a whole lot of things actually happening all at the same time. It's huge, absolutely huge. Is that your experience too? Yes, yes it is, and, and some of these these parents are be, being constricted scripted into work. They, they, they would rather stay at home with their children, as would many parents and the ones who can afford to can. But it's, I think, extra heart-rending for parents who really want to do that, but the, the system's forcing them to do something else. And financially, they'll probably end up much worse off. And if they've got to pay for transport and work clothes and um, their own their own meals in the middle of the day, so yeah, it's very difficult. And it's even I mean I I know myself because I go home and have to create a meal and I've got um, grandchildren in tow sometimes um, in doing this. But if you if you come home having done a, a day's work, the likelihood of you spending time cooking something that was lower cost has gone out the window. So even the, the cost of your food goes up when you go back to work. What sort of special learning needs, physical delays and hearing problems have you seen in the children in your centre? Wow, over um, you know, 11 years of being at Small Cardi, we've had children from fairly severe delays um, on the autistic spectrum through to high functioning. Um, we've had things from mutism um, through to global developmental dis delays, so that affects language, um, social, emotional, physical, together. Many of the children who are arriving at the centre at um, between the ages of three and four with the drive for increased participation come and we actually pick up that they have some sort of um, hearing disability or whatever that hasn't been noticed at, at this point. So um, we may have a child who's nearly four with the language of someone who's maybe two. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, then we have to go through the process of trying to get support and help to try and lift that child's development. You organised for hearing and vision testing teams to come to the centre, didn't you? We did, yeah. When we first started, um, we 
um, set up a relationship with Turugi Health and we also organised for Hearing and Vision to come down. They had an office in, up in the Mangari Town Centre and it was wonderful. They had a specialist ear nurse um, up at that clinic and they also had um, hearing um, ear, nose and throat specialists that came in regularly. So if a child was detected then they were referred to the clinic and then they got actioned. And you'll know, Meg, that it's changed now. Mm. They won't test. It's taken up under the um, B45 um, group, and they won't test any child who hasn't had their fourth birthday. So early intervention has, you know, mm. what is early intervention? On the mm. ministry site, it says that early intervention can happen from birth. But, you know, we're not seeing that. We're seeing... When we do a referral, we, um, we have to gather data first to make sure we're doing a, a good form and we send it into the ministry and we get a receipt let letter back to say that um, we will review your application, your referral, and it will either be accepted or declined. Um, and that's a fairly new letter actually. And then later you'll get another letter that will say we've accepted your referral and we'll undertake to see your child, this child, within 90 days um, because that's what basically their services can allow. So another three months. So your four-year-old who has the language of a two-year-old or, or less um, will be referred and then wait at least another three months before anybody will do anything. Thanks very much, Linda. Thank you, Meg. Now it's time for news of the week. The NZEI Teru Roa has published a 10 minute video on YouTube about quality in early childhood care and education. You can find the link to the video on the NZEI's website. Child Poverty Action Group will on Monday 9 June launch the second report in its pre-election series of papers about aspects of child poverty. The document will focus on early childhood care and education and will contain 11 recommendations about the policies required for high quality services to preschool children. An Auckland landlord is seeking to rent a caravan with no built-in toilet or shower facilities for $200 a week. Peter Gee headed his ad Arabian Nights Wow and said that 1,200 people had viewed the details on Trade Me. He said that a one-bedroom flat in Sandringham would cost $350 a week, while a two-bedroom rental would be $425 and three bedrooms $585. He described his caravan as incredibly cheap. The Children's Commissioner has published a research brief about the impact of child poverty legislation in the United Kingdom and what lessons New Zealand can take from such an approach. The document is based on a research paper by John Hancock. Both reports can be found on the Children's Commissioner's website. The brief says that one of the fundamental strengths of the United Kingdom's Child Poverty Act is that rare political consensus which led to its enactment. The document also states that a legislative approach inserts into law a commitment to reducing child poverty. In the United Kingdom, this has led to the implementation of a systematic approach to poverty policy development across the layers of government. Statutory status also means that government performance in reducing child poverty is subject to enduring public scrutiny and transparency. And for a different view, the number of British youngsters living in poverty will reach 5 million by the end of the decade unless politicians take their promises to eradicate child poverty seriously or save the children. The organisation has accused all the main political parties of lacking the credibility and willpower to deliver on their shared legal requirement to cut child poverty levels significantly. It says that 5 million children, up from the current 3 million, will be living in poverty by 2020 if planned welfare spending cuts go ahead and no action is taken to alleviate the growing cost of living pressures on Britain's poorest families. 
Save the Children says that all the main political parties treat the Child Poverty Act as window dressing and none has a viable strategy to implement its aims. Awaso Academy International will next year mark five years of operation and plans a series of celebrations. The school installed electricity, meaning that about 500 people near the school received electricity years earlier than they otherwise would have done. A well provided for the school supplies water for 200 families. The school now plans to grow vegetables and raise livestock so it can feed the children. A 20-year-long study has found that a group of developmentally delayed children in Jamaica exposed to positive parental intervention experienced 25% more in average earnings compared with a control group. Researchers said that the interventions doubled as a long-term poverty reduction program, improving the cognitive skills that would assist the children in future. Now it's time for this week's five action points. The Ministry of Education and the Education Review Office should work together to provide clear guidelines for early childhood care and education services, including requirements for high quality and culturally and linguistically responsive teacher training. Resources should be made available to promote Te Reo Māori and Pacific Islands languages and cultures within the ECCE sector. The government should increase the ratios of adults to children, particularly for infants and toddlers, and set limits on group sizes. All teaching staff and centre-based teacher-led services should be required to hold a teacher registration recognised teacher qualification. Resources should be provided to support refugee children and their families through appropriate ECCE services. That's our programme for this week. Join us next week when we'll look at compulsory education. What needs to be done in Aotearoa to ensure that children from poor families receive quality education and leave school with the qualifications they need to play a meaningful role in the workforce? How does family disadvantage prevent children from learning properly? We'll speak to Phil Palfrey, the principal of Manurewa East School, and Dr. Vicky Carpenter from the University of Auckland. Thanks for watching. Kakiteano.